Our Jesus, we thank you so much for your love and your compassion and your mercy and the fact that you invite us to come follow you in faith. And we pray that we would see you through eyes of faith and we would trust you appropriately. Would you teach us today, fill us here with your spirit so that we might receive your word with understanding. And we ask these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I don't get a chance to do it very often anymore, but once every blue moon, I get the opportunity to just sit down uh, by myself, open up my old hymnal, and just play some uh, hymns instrumentally. And I have a great time worshiping when I get to do it. It's just really fun. And of course, when I go and do that, I have certain um, hymns that I always go back to, certain songs that I just love to play. One of my very favorite to play is an old Fanny Crosby tune by the name of Pass Me Not. And the reason I like to play it so much is not because I play it so well, but I remember a version that uh, an old mentor of mine used to play that was just absolutely fantastic by the name of David Nail. I can still hear his version in my head. I can never duplicate it, but I can hear it. And so I have a great time playing that. But the lyrics for the first verse of Pass Me Not are this. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And uh, Miss Crosby's song, I don't know if it was written with this in mind, but could have very easily been sung by this blind man here at the end of Luke chapter 18. There are actually uh, two events that take place at the end of chapter 18 that we read today. And there's been so many opportunities like that as we've gone through the Gospel of Luke. There's these little vignettes, and some of these things don't really seem to match together. Uh, we don't know how they are related at first glance, but uh, we do need to remember these things are arranged purposefully, and we want to look at the reason why Luke put these things in the way that he did. What we have here are, are two conversations, and there's two titles you might have noticed that are used to refer to Jesus. Each one recognized him as the Messiah. The, the one is Jesus as the Son of Man, that Jesus refers to himself, and the other is Jesus as the Son of David, which the blind man uses. The first event deals with the cross and the resurrection. The second deals with a miraculous healing. So we say, well, what do these things have in common? One thing we see here is actually a, a contrast. The first shows Jesus, or at least his words, hidden in plain sight from the understanding of the apostles. And the second shows Jesus revealed to a blind man who has immense faith. Now, Jesus was constantly with the 12 disciples, but there was much that they could not comprehend. Jesus had just briefly come into the presence of the blind man, and this blind man saw him instantly for who he is. And that blind man didn't want to have his opportunity pass him by. Now, contextually, coming up to this point in Luke 18, Luke has most recently showed Jesus talking with a rich young ruler. And that man had come to Jesus asking what he could do to inherit eternal life. Of course, he was already fully convinced of his own self-righteousness. He was just looking for the icing on the cake that, you know, guaranteed him his salvation. And once Jesus pointed out the idolatry that was in that man's own heart, it was quickly apparent he wasn't righteous at all. And that man had the opportunity to leave everything behind and repentance, go follow Jesus as a disciple, but he didn't do it. He made a decision to choose his stuff over the Savior, and he walked away, sad. The disciples, on the other hand, they had left everything to follow Jesus. They knew Jesus was worth it all, and Jesus promised them an amazing inheritance in the future. And not only did they have the benefits of living as children of God right now in the present day, but they would look forward to living in the presence of God for all eternity. And those were wonderful promises. But there was something else that needed to come first, something else that the disciples might not find quite as pleasing. The kingdom would come, but the price of sin had to be paid. Salvation would be given, but it would come at the cost of the death of Jesus. That was the reason he came, and Jesus was going to see it through. So in the meantime, being told these things, would the disciples hold to him in faith? Would they simply believe Jesus for who he is and for what the Bible prophesied him to do? Well, the blind man would. Now, he knew less of Jesus, but what he did know, he believed. And he was going to hold on to Jesus no matter what. So let's look at how these two events relate together. We first start with this 
you know, prophecy of his rejection as the son of man, verse 31 says this, then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all the things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man will be accomplished. Now we want to notice three things before we leave this verse. Number one, we want to note the audience. By this point in his ministry, large crowds were following Jesus around. And of course, that would have even been the case among the rich young ruler. That young ruler didn't come to Jesus when he was all alone. He would have come through the crowds to ask Jesus how to inherit eternal life. And of course, Jesus was talking with Peter and the other disciples, but the other people were there in this follow-up conversation. No indication that they were alone with Jesus when talking to him. But here, Jesus specifically takes the 12 aside to talk to them about what was about to happen. This was for their ears and their preparation. Not that they would understand it all, but Jesus still made it available to the 12. So we notice the audience. Second, we notice the mission. He says, we are going up to Jerusalem. Now that in itself isn't unusual. Passover was near, as we're going to find out in just a couple weeks. He's you know, uh, already there at the triumphal entry. The multitudes of Jews went up on a yearly pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Jesus and the disciples were no stranger to the city. They had been there many occasions in the past. But this trip would be different. This was the end to which Jesus had set his mind that we read so long ago in chapter 9, verse 51. He had set his mind to go to Jerusalem. So the earthly ministry of Jesus was about to come to climax. This was the reason he had come. And this is why he takes the time to underscore it with the 12 disciples. Because even if they didn't understand everything right now, they needed to be able to look back after Jesus rose. And they needed to be able to remember that Jesus had told them what was going to happen and how often he told them what was going to happen. They needed to know that this was central to everything that he did. Please don't miss this aspect about Jesus. For all that's written and said about Jesus, his miracles, his healings, his acts of compassion, and all the rest, all of those things are secondary to the cross. Without question, they're important. They help us understand the loving character of our Savior. But without the cross, Jesus wouldn't be our Savior. The whole of his earthly life centered on what would take place at the cross and the resurrection. And without that singular event, little else in the ministry of Jesus matters. And this is the lens through which we've got to look at Jesus. He is a wonderful teacher, but he's more than a teacher. He is the embodiment of love and compassion, but he's more than a nice guy. He comes with a prophetic voice of truth, calls out hypocrisy in religion, he, he calls out injustice, but he isn't a social justice warrior. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the Son of God. He's the sin sacrifice given by God. He's the substitute for you and me. And that, by far, is his most important role, and that's the one to which Jesus was singularly focused. That's the mission. What's the method? Well, he says, all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. Now, from the disciples' point of view at the time, before Jesus you know, goes on in a couple of sentences to finish what he's going to say, in that moment, all of this would have sounded great. Because after all, the prophets did write a lot concerning the future Messiah, his future glories, the renewal of the kingdom of Israel, his reign over all of the earth. That's exactly what they were expecting. Of course, Jesus had told them there were going to be sufferings and other things earlier on, at least two other times he had talked about his death. But that's what the disciples were expecting. They were expecting to go to Jerusalem and have Jesus inherit the kingdom right there. That's what the crowds were expecting. That's what we're going to see on Palm Sunday with the triumphal entry in just a couple of weeks. They were expecting this large, magnificent reign of Jesus. And all those things were certainly predicted by the prophets. These were the promises that the disciples would have loved and memorized, written down in their little Bible promise books and all the rest. It's the other aspect of his suffering that they wouldn't have known quite so well but it was that aspect, his suffering, that Jesus is referencing. Look at verse 32 as he goes on. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. And he says that the Messiah will be humiliated in horrendous ways. And two basic categories here. First, he would be delivered to the Gentiles. Jesus would be betrayed by a kiss from one of his own, originally taken into custody by the Jewish priests and the Pharisees, but they would hand him over to Pilate and the Romans. 
And Jesus, remember, he's the Jewish Messiah. He is the king and the hope of Israel. Yet Israel would reject him and send him to the Gentiles for torture and death. That's the first aspect. The second aspect is that he'd be mocked and insulted and spit upon. Now, those are all distinct verbs, of course, but they refer to the same sort of emotional assault experienced by Jesus at the hands of both the Gentiles and the Jews. Before Jesus was ever handed over to Pilate, Jesus was beaten even while he's still in the custody of the Sanhedrin. We'll read that in chapter 22, verses 63 through 65. Once he's given over to Pilate, Pilate, of course, passed him on to Herod. Herod, as a Gentile, was proceeding to mock the true king of the Jews. Chapter 23, verse 11. Herod hangs him, or sends him back. Pilate sends him to the cross. And while he's on the cross, Jesus is mocked by both Jew and Roman. You know, say, if you're truly the Savior of the world, if you're truly the Son of God, you save yourself. Chapter 23, verses 35 through 36. Mocked, insulted, spat upon. Matthew writes that, about that in Matthew 27. And Jesus knew all these things would happen, and they did. And the whole idea is one of ultimate humiliation. Things that no single person should ever experience, much less Almighty God in the flesh. Surely he would not experience these things, yet this is exactly how Jesus painted the picture. These things were written, he says, concerning the Son of Man, verse 31. That's not a title concerning his humanity. That's a title concerning his deity, of his equality with the all-powerful, all-glorious God. It comes from Daniel chapter 7. Equating the Son of Man to be with God, reigning in the power of God, coming with the glory of God. Yet these are the things that the Son of Man would endure, this sort of humiliation. He ought to have been honored by every human in all history, yet the creator of all the universe takes on the scorn of his rebellious creation. And you know what? He did it willingly. He did it out of love for us in order that we might be saved. This is part of the plan of God for him. Question, did the prophets really write of this sort of humiliation coming to the Savior? Yes. None of this should have been a surprise to Jewish students of their Bible. Now, these might not have been the promises they memorized, but these were predicted in the pages of the New Testament. Daniel 9, verse 26, talks about how the Messiah was going to be cut off and rejected. Isaiah 50, verse 6, talks about how the Messiah would give over his back to those who struck him, his cheeks to those who would pluck out his beard, and he did not hide his face from shame and spitting. Psalm 109, verse 25, the Messiah would be a reproach to the people, and they would shake, or they would wag their heads at him in insult. Of course, all of Isaiah chapter 53, the Messiah would be despised, rejected, become the lamb of sacrifice. He would be killed for the transgression of all people. All those prophets are full of statements regarding the humiliation, the suffering, the rejection, and of course the death of the Messiah. And scripture is incredibly specific to this aspect of his suffering. Psalm 22, we talk about Psalm 22 thinking about the cross, and of course it does, but it also talks about his humiliation. Psalm 22, verses 6 or 8, by I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. That's almost a verbatim quote of what would be said 500 years later when Jesus is hanging on the cross. That is the scorn that Jesus endured for you and for me. That is the humiliation he took upon himself. Now that's difficult enough for us to comprehend, and we're looking at it with the benefit of hindsight, knowing the end of the story. But imagine yourself in the shoes of the apostles. Regarding the Messiah, that would have been unthinkable to the twelve. Surely that wouldn't happen to Jesus, the Son of Man, the Messiah, the King of Israel. Wouldn't happen to him, but it would. And it was foretold by the prophets, and, and more than that, as cruel as this treatment of the Messiah would be, that wasn't the end of it. Look at verse 33, and they would scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Now to be scourged was a fate almost worse than death, yet Jesus would endure that. He could have called down 12 legions of angels to take vengeance upon the guy who uh, held that cruel Roman cat of nine tails that tore into his flesh with every strike. Yet Jesus says nothing. I think his strength is heartily more evident in the New Testament when he keeps his omnipotent power under control when he's being physically tortured in that moment. He was scourged, and of course that would lead to 
and end in death. And he would die in one of the most violent, worst ways imaginable. No quick beheading, no humane treatment. He dies by slowly suffocating on the cross and his heart ruptures after all of this torture. And again, keep in mind, this is the Messiah. This is the Son of Man. This is the divine King of King and Lord of Lords who's going to come in all power and all glory and reign over all the earth, Daniel chapter 7. But this Son of Man who's prophesied to reign is also prophesied to die. So people say, well, how can that be? Well, looking back at it, the better question would be, how could it be otherwise? Without the death of the incarnate Son of God, we have no chance to be saved. We would have no atonement for sin because there would be no sufficient sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews says that it's impossible for bulls and goats to take away the sin of men. You can't sacrifice enough animals in order to do it. What's needed is an equivalent sacrifice. And not just a sacrifice of a, a single man for a single sin, because remember the wages of sin is death, so one sin, one death. But you need enough sacrifice for all sins of all men, of all women, for all human history. How do you accomplish that? Well, it's impossible other than the death of the infinite God made flesh. And that's exactly who Jesus is, and that's exactly what he did. So praise God that he was obedient to fulfill all the prophecies of all the prophets. So he gives a lot of build-up to his words, a lot of bad news on top of bad news. Yet it all leads to something wonderful. It leads to resurrection. He said, and the third day he will rise again. So the prophesied death and humiliation of the Messiah would not be in vain. It leads to victory. The prophesied death leads to prophesied resurrection. And it was prophesied. Psalm 16, verse 10, one of the most famous prophecies of his resurrection. You won't leave his soul in Sheol. They won't see corruption. Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11 talks about how he would... God would prolong his days. He would see the, the, the reward for the things that he did. So the resurrection, that should have been the thing that the, the events, uh, the, the, the disciples focused on, rather. Should have focused on that because that was the best news. They didn't. They focused on the bad news. We want to focus on the best news. Don't forget the best news. Don't leave out the good stuff. Now, let me say this. It is right for us to remember the cross and Jesus' sufferings that led to it. That's the cost of our sal salvation. We cannot, dare not forget it because otherwise we'll take our salvation for granted. But don't stop the remembrances too soon. The death of Christ leads to the resurrection of Christ. The very reason we have a Jesus to worship is because Jesus is risen from the grave. And there are too many churches, too many Christian traditions out there that worship a dead Jesus. And they never think of him beyond the cross. One of the reasons you'll never see a crucifix in this building is because it shows Jesus dead on the cross and Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. Jesus isn't dead. He was dead, but he is alive. So we never want to forget the resurrection. We want to rejoice in it. Now for the disciples, all they heard was the bad news. They didn't hear Jesus say about the third day. So it left them confused. It left them bewildered. Look at verse 34. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them. And they did not know the things which were spoken. And this almost seems so inconceivable to us, right? How could they be so dense? How could they not understand? They've been with Jesus for nearly three years by this point. Jesus had repeatedly spoken of the cross and the resurrection. The synoptic gospels record a minimum of three formal teachings, this being the third there's allusions to it throughout his ministry. How could they miss so much? We want to be careful not to assume too much of the apostles in all this. Again, we look back at Jesus' words through post-resurrection eyes. We've got the fullness of the scriptures for us. We've got 2,000 years of Christian theology to explain it. The disciples were going through this all in real time. Right? These things were unfolding before their eyes, and they had nothing except their own preconceived notions of the Scripture. They had their cultural expectations of the Messiah to, to rely upon. So we've got to give them a, a little grace here. And more than that, there seems to have been some providential work of God in this as well. Luke mentions that this saying was hidden from them. Now, this could be interpreted a few different ways. Was it hidden because they had their biases and their preconceived notions? Or was it hidden because of the sovereign choice of God? Luke doesn't say, but perhaps a bit of both could be at work. The disciples, of course, would understand in time. Jesus, though, he needed to go through his suffering and all the rest without interference. 
Remember when Jesus first formally announced his suffering, death, and resurrection, Peter pulled him aside and chastised him for suggesting such a thing. And Jesus' response was what? Get behind me, Satan. Matthew 16, 22, and 23. So it's possible that if the disciples truly understood what awaited Jesus, they probably would have attempted to interfere along the way. And so this may have been God's sovereign work to prevent them from acting. But whatever the reason was that these words were hidden from their understanding, it was still hidden, they were left confused, and they would remain confused until they actually witnessed Jesus risen from the dead. So what were the disciples supposed to do in the meantime if this was hidden from them? What could they do in the meantime? Simple, trust Jesus. They may not have understood everything Jesus said and everything that was about to happen, but they could rest in the fact that Jesus understood and that this was the plan of God at work. They simply needed to trust Christ. And they'd struggle to do this well, of course, understandably. What do we do when we don't understand things? What do we do when we don't know why God has allowed our circumstances to become what they are? Trust Jesus. Trust that he does know and he understands. Now, just to state a little bit of the obvious, you and I, we're not omniscient. We don't know all things. If you think you do, we need to have a conversation afterwards. But God does see all things. God does know all things. We cannot see the beginning and the end, but God can. Trust Jesus. Walk in faith. Whether in times of understanding or in times of confusion, choose to trust Christ and to follow him. So what happens at this point is a little bit of a change in scenery. But it seems apparent that Luke includes this as a solid contrast to what just happened. The disciples there are left reeling and they're confused about what was about to happen to the Son of Man. Although Jesus clearly spoke of a, a resurrection and a victory, they're just completely focused on his suffering and his death. The idea that the Messiah would be rejected is tantamount to thinking that the Messiah would be a failure. That's a blasphemous thought. But that's where they're left. Was he? Did Jesus lack the power to fulfill the role of the Messiah? Well, not by a long shot. Jesus doesn't lack power in the slightest. His power is voluntarily restrained during his future suffering and death. But his current power would be easily seen in the events that follow. This is where we see his authority as the son of David. Verse 35, Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now, before we get too far in this, we need to address a little bit of potential controversy regarding the details here. Because each of the synoptic gospels, when I say synoptic, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each of these records a version of this event. By the way, John does recount the healing of a blind man in John 9, but there's a different event, different healing altogether. That uh, it takes place in Jerusalem and all sorts of things. But among the synoptics, the, the event is the same, but the details do vary. Mark alone gives us a name, names this man Bartimaeus, Mark 10, 46 through 52. Matthew alone, out of the three, declares that there were two men. You can read his account, Matthew 20, verse 29 through 34. Both Matthew and Mark describe Jesus coming out of Jericho, where Luke says that Jesus was coming near Jericho. Now, there's a lot of details that overlap, but there's obviously several that don't. Is this evidence of error in our Bible? Is this proof that the Bible contradicts itself? No, not in the slightest. The wording of whether or not Jesus was entering Jericho or leaving Jericho may not be as big of a deal as a lot of people make it out to be. All accounts agree that Jesus was outside the city and he's en route to Jerusalem could just be different ways of saying the same thing depending on your point of view. But beyond all of that, you know, all directional language might be accounted for on which Jericho is actually being referenced here. See, archaeology has verified the existence of an old city and a new city. I got a little map for you. <laughs> Probably doesn't tell you too much from that map, but you at least see that they were right next to each other. The old city today, you can visit it today, visit its ruins called Tel El Sultan. Tel El Sultan. 
And although that was the location of the original Jericho, it was a very large city by the 7th century B.C. It was destroyed by the Babylonians when they came through Judah, conquering the land and on their route to Jerusalem. Once the Jews returned to their homeland, Jericho was in, rebuilt, but it was rebuilt in a slightly different location, just a little bit south. And that was the Jericho in existence and populated during the Hasmonean kingdoms and the Herodian kingdoms. In other words, that was the New Testament Jericho, where it's mentioned there, that's the place that uh, people would refer to Jericho in the times of, of Jesus. And so you got this situation here. It's quite possible that Luke describes Jesus leaving old Jericho, which still existed, but in ruins, Matthew and Mark describe Jesus coming near New Jericho with the miraculous healing taking place in between the two locations. Perfectly resolves itself. As far as the other details, it's not of all uncommon for Mark to include details left out by the other gospel writers. It's interesting. He has the shortest of the gospel accounts, but he gives some of the most picturesque details, including this name of Bartimaeus. Maybe he was known by Peter or, or John Mark personally, so that was the reason for inclusion. Matthew's detail of two men, that's a, perhaps a, a bit curious, but it's not contradictory because nowhere do Mark nor Luke say there were only one blind man present. They just record the actions and the words of one. So maybe Bartimaeus was the vocal one and the other one was just along for the ride and in agreement. Keep in mind that the synoptic gospels provide different perspectives of the same events, but differences are not the same thing as contradictions. The Bible is proven true time and time and time again. And as we've said many times before, anytime there's a question, we've got to give the Bible the benefit of the doubt. Because whatever the potential confusion might be, there is always a plausible explanation. Our scriptures are totally trustworthy. Now that all being said, let me suggest this too. Be careful to read each gospel account for itself. We don't need to try to read Matthew into Luke. We don't need to try to read Luke into Mark and so on. Each writer speaks for himself, and he has his reasons for including the details that he includes because they were guided by the Holy Spirit, each one of them, in doing so when they wrote. And if we spend all of our time trying to read the Gospels totally parallel to each other, we're going to miss the point that each individual author is making. So we want to be careful not to miss out. So what's Luke saying here, right? Let's look at that. The situation here, Jesus and the disciples are walking the road to Jerusalem. They're traveling between the Jerichos, right? So at this point, at Jesus' ministry, it's not just Jesus and the Twelve. It's this growing crowd of people, many of whom would accompany Jesus into Jerusalem during the triumphal entry. This kind of crowd starts to make, obviously, quite a bit of noise as they're walking down the road, something that would have attracted the attention of blind men sitting by the roadside begging. It gets the attention of this one man described by Luke who asks the people next to him what's going on, and whoever answered him answers with just the basics and nothing else. Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now what this man had heard of Jesus of Nazareth, we don't know. But what we do know is that whatever it was, it was enough for him to be convinced that Jesus was none other than the Messiah. And what begins at this point is a marvelous demonstration of faith. Look at verse 38. And he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before him warned that he should be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. First thing we see here is he has faith that Jesus is the Son of David. Now, although the Son of David, that term is a common term for the Messiah, this is the very first use in the Gospel of Luke, and it's only one of two uses in the Gospel of Luke overall. Mark the same way, by the way. But it refers specifically to the future role of the Messiah within a restored kingdom and a Davidic royal dynasty. Remember when God made the covenant with David, he promised David that his house, his dynasty, would be built by God and that the throne of a very specific son, a descendant of David, would be established forever. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13. The prophets repeatedly wrote of a future Davidic ruler. The people of Israel would return to repentance, seeking God and, according to Hosea 3, 5, and David their king. They wrote that God would save the glory of the house of David. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7. The promised son to Isaiah, it was going to be the wonderful God, mighty counselor, would be where? On the throne of David. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. There would be a branch to the house of David, according to Jeremiah 23, that would be raised up to a prosperous kingdom. We just read about that, by the way, in Zechariah chapter 3 as well. 
So the Old Testament is overwhelmingly clear that a physical descendant of David will one day sit on the throne over Israel as a literal king in a literal kingdom. What's the point? The point is the blind man believed Jesus to be this king. Now keep in mind at the time, Jesus had no political power. Quite the opposite. He was hated by the Herodians. He was hated by the Romans. He was hated by the Jewish leadership. No political power. Jesus had no riches. He had no army. He had no attempt made to take the kingdom for himself. And even when one, the people wanted to take him and force him to be king after he fed the multitudes, he refused to do so. John six fifteen. He slipped out of their hands and slipped away from them. How could it then be that this blind man believed Jesus to be the son of David, the rightful king over a restored kingdom of Israel? Because he had faith. He saw beyond the immediate surface level circumstances to the person of Jesus. And he knew that no one except the legitimate son of David would be able to speak and to act with the authority that Jesus did. In other words, you might say that the blind man did not see as man sees because man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. And the blind man was seeing Jesus in the same way. So he had faith that Jesus was the son of David. He also had faith that Jesus would be merciful. Now he believed Jesus to be the king. He did not, though, believe Jesus to be uncaring. He called out to Christ as the merciful king, as someone who's willing and able to demonstrate true compassion. See, this man recognized his own pitiful state, and he knew that unless he anointed God, right, extended the mercy of God to him, he would have no hope. He was absolutely right. Of course, the same situation exists for all of us. We are left in helpless states because of our sin. And unless Jesus gives us the mercy of God, we are doomed forever. But Jesus is merciful. He is compassionate. He is loving. He is kind. And he responds to those who call out to him in faith. So he had faith that Jesus is the son of David. He had faith that Jesus is merciful. He had faith to cry out to Jesus. And to continue crying out despite immense opposition from the crowds. The crowds are annoyed at this man's cries. And, and the, the word that's used for his cries almost speaks of a, um, a bird crying out, an animalistic sort of cry. I mean, just gut-wrenching sort of shout that he's making. They're annoyed by him. They don't want any sort of distraction from their own enjoyment of the spectacle passing through outside of town. These man's shouts were pathetic to their ears. They didn't want to be bothered by it. Probably don't want to be reminded of the presence of this little beggar over here. Yet this man was persistent and he cried out all the more. He wasn't going to let anyone stop him from calling out to Jesus. And he knew that Jesus was worth all the effort. He was worth all of the scorn of the world. Of course he is. Now he's not done demonstrating his faith, but notice Jesus responds at this point. Verse 40, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. So he had faith that Jesus had mercy. Jesus did have mercy. He had the man brought to him, and Jesus gave the man his complete attention. And understand this, just to call the man to himself, that is an act of mercy because it's the king giving this man an audience. Ancient kings had the right to execute people who simply showed up to the throne unannounced. It's part of the drama behind Ahasuerus and Esther and, and the, the account of Esther. Jesus didn't have to give any attention to this man. After all, he's on his way to Jerusalem. There's things to do, people to see, prophecies to fulfill. But he stops everything. He brings the blind man into his presence. And even his question to the blind man demonstrates mercy. He makes himself available to the man, even though this man had done nothing deserving of favor. The blind man was a sinner, just like all men and women are sinners, all of us. He neither did anything for Jesus, nor was he capable of doing anything for Jesus. All he could do was cry out and trust that Jesus would show him mercy, and that's what Jesus did. Guys, do we understand the privilege we have just in the fact that we have an audience with Almighty God? Just with the invitation to address God in prayer as our Heavenly Father because of what Jesus has done for us, there's no reason whatsoever that Jesus should make himself available to us, yet he does. His mercies are incredible. So Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? I love the question. Why did he ask the question? As God, Jesus obviously knew what was in the heart of the man. And even from a human perspective, we've got to think it's not too difficult to surmise that 
when a blind man's calling out to a miracle maker for a miracle, he probably wants to be healed. Answer, because Jesus wanted the man to make his request. He wanted the man to ask. It's one thing to have faith to address Jesus. It's another thing to have faith to make a request. Jesus gave the man an opportunity to express his faith, and he did. This goes to the heart of the issue of salvation. Why is it that some people are saved and other people are not? How can it be that Jesus died for the entire world, yet only a percentage of the people in the world are saved? Because only a percentage of the people in the world have faith enough to ask. Jesus died for the entire world. He makes himself available to the entire world, but few people ever ask. You want to ask. If you know you have the opportunity to believe, then you need to believe. Make your request known to God. Ask to be forgiven of sin. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Ask to be made the man or woman that God desires you to be. Express your faith. He will respond. Ask. And this man did ask. Once more he shows his faith, this time through his request. He had faith enough to ask for a miraculous healing. And this shows his faith-filled understanding of who the Messiah actually is. Because he knows that you know Jesus is, as a son of David, He's more than just a normal son of David, right? He wasn't just someone like, you know, Solomon or Hezekiah or even Joseph. This is more than just a man. No, this Messiah, this son of David is far greater than any who come before. He's no ordinary man. He's no ordinary king. Jesus has the full power and authority of Almighty God. If Jesus commands something to happen, it can happen. And not only does he have the faith to ask for healing, he has faith that Jesus is able to heal. Look at verse 42. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith, has made you well. It's one thing to ask for something in prayer. It's another to actually believe you're going to receive it. A lot of people go through the motions of asking and they mouth the words in prayer because, you know, that's the religious thing to do. Not everybody actually believes. This man believed, and the result of his faith was his healing. Without physical eyes functioning at all, he had seen Jesus as a powerful, authoritative son of David. And now, after Jesus' work, he can look upon Jesus with his eyes as well as with his heart. Do you want to see Jesus? Faith comes first. Express your faith. By the way, literally, Jesus told him, your faith has saved you. Now, without question, the context is a miraculous healing, but there's no doubt that a double meaning is intended by Luke. This man had a new beginning not only on his current life, but for all eternity. His whole world was immediately and forever changed because of his faith in Jesus as the Christ, the son of David. Prior to that moment, he's just a blind beggar, hoping for coins from passing strangers as they make their pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Now he's a recipient of the mercies of God. He's seen Jesus with his own eyes as Lord and Savior, saved from the past. He's got a glorious eternal future ahead of him. He was saved. By the way, was there some sort of magical quality about his faith that he's able to save him? No, because it's not unaccompanied faith that saved the blind man. It wasn't him believing in himself, willing himself to see. People say, just believe. Well, what are you believing in? It's the object of the man's faith that saved. It's Jesus. The man needed faith, but he needed faith in the person of Christ. Anything else is a waste. And this is what too many people get wrong. Some people believe that just simple sincerity is enough. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you sincerely believe it. God's going to know your heart. <laughs> He's going to see your faith. He's going to honor that. No, God will know your heart and he'll know it to be sinful without an atoning sacrifice. Belief that sincerity is all that matters, that's a ridiculous argument on its face. Try, try using that in any other situation and scenario. See how it works. Just believe that you can fly and you will. Just believe that that rat poison will heal your cancer and it will. It's sincere, but it's sincerely going to take you to the grave. Just believe in your own spirituality. Whatever you believe, just believe in whatever religion you want. People think they're being compassionate when they say that. That's not compassionate. That's dooming those who believe that. Sincere faith is needed to be saved, 
But we've got to have sincere faith in the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, crucified for sin and risen from the dead. And that's the sort of faith Paul wrote about when he wrote to the Romans in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's faith there, real, sincere, heartfelt faith, but it's faith in the truth of God, it's faith in Jesus, and it's that type of faith, that only type of faith that will save. By the way, this is true regarding all aspects of the Christian life, even beyond our initial justification. Do we need sincere faith in regards to all of our prayer requests? Absolutely we do. But our faith is in Jesus, not in ourselves, not in our own self-will. Our trust has to be in Christ and Christ alone. Our faith by itself does nothing. Faith in Jesus does miracles because Jesus does miracles. So we're trusting him and his will to be done in all things. Verse 43, and immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. So there's one more demonstration of faith from this formerly blind man. He had faith to follow Jesus as a disciple. And we don't know what happened to the man after this point. Scripture doesn't tell us how long he followed Jesus. Though when we consider Mark mentions him by name, it's likely he followed him for the rest of his life. At the very least, this one moment shows the follow through to his faith. Because guess what? This blind man did what the rich young ruler just a few verses earlier could not do. Follow Christ. Now that young ruler had all kinds of things that this blind beggar could have only have dreamt about. Power, wealth, comfort. But those were the things that blocked him from following Jesus in faith. But the man once blind had nothing but misery and he gladly left it all behind. Truth be told, the rich young ruler had nothing but misery. He just didn't know it. He couldn't see it. His circumstances blinded him to the spiritual things that Bartimaeus saw clearly. The ruler was just as sinful, just as desperate for salvation. He had the same opportunity with Jesus. He had a same audience with the Lord. Jesus' same mercy was extended to him, just like it was on the road to Jericho. But the rich man never saw his need. So between the rich man and the blind man, which one was more blessed? The one that was saved. Of course, the result, not only did he glorify God, but so did everybody else. Praise in the works of Jesus is contagious. That's what we spread when we spread the gospel. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you hold to him in faith? The disciples were confused by what they heard, even though they spent a lot of time with Jesus. They lacked a full understanding. These things would be revealed in time. God had his plan at work. But the disciples still needed to make the choice to walk by faith, trusting Jesus for who he is, for what the Bible says about him. But the blind man, he had far less that he knew of Jesus in the first place. But what he knew was enough. He had faith that Jesus is the rightful king of Israel. He had faith not to be hushed by the crowds. He had faith that Jesus is compassionate and merciful. Who not only gave him the opportunity to ask, but had the ability to act. He had faith that Jesus could save, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Guys, do we have that kind of faith? It's not faith for faith's sake. It's faith in Jesus, that he is who the Bible says he is, that he does what the Bible says that he does. This is the faith that God desires for us. This is the faith that saves. Maybe you're here and you find yourself, someone in the shoes of the apostles, you've believed on Jesus for eternal life, but you're confused about other things. You're not sure what's going on in the present. You're not sure what's going on for God's will for you right now. Trust Christ. If you trusted him for his salvation, you can trust him for the present day. Trust that he knows what he's doing because he does know what he's doing. But maybe you're here and you're more like blind Bartimaeus. You've heard of Jesus in the past, but you've never had a true encounter with him. You've got an opportunity today to have that encounter. You've got the opportunity today to be saved. Don't let it pass you by. Respond to him. Ask in faith. And he will answer. And you can do that right now as we pray. Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. I thank you that he did exactly what he was prophesied to do. He did suffer He did die for us at the cross, paying the debt that we owed for our sins. 
But I thank you, Lord, that he has risen today. He is victorious over the grave. And because he is, he can offer eternal life to all who believe. All who ask to be saved through Jesus Christ. Lord, your Bible, your word says you will save. And so, Lord, I would pray for those who are among us today who have not yet asked. Help them ask now in this time in their heart, in their own way. Help them cry out to Jesus just like the blind man did. Passionately, sincerely, faith-filled, trusting Christ that Jesus, you are God who came for me, who died for me, who offers to save me, so save me, forgive me. Help those who are praying to Jesus now turn from their sins, forsake them, leave them in the past. Ask to be forgiven. Then help them trust your promises that Jesus does save. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're good to your word and that you save all those who come to you in faith. And I pray, Lord, that those who cry out to you now would have the assurance that you have heard them and that you're good to your word. Fill us with your spirit as we would go forth from this place that we could glorify you and the people would be so impacted by our joy for Jesus that they would praise God as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.